Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me today in my private chambers in my reading rainbow here on the hill. And I want to talk to you about a book that I read. I, I read a book. Holy cow. I'm excited. I'm proud. I read a book. Uh, actually, I read it. It's been a little while now since I read it. I should do these things immediately after. So it's fresh on the brain and the fog hasn't settled in and, and all that stuff. But the book that I read that I want to talk about is a book called Antimatter Blues by Edward Ashton. Ever hear of it? Well, I recommend you hear of it. And you, as you can tell, this was a book from a friendly neighborhood library. Not my library. My library in the town that I live in always seems to be closed. Every time I go there on a Saturday, library's closed. Every time I go there on the evening, library's closed. So it's almost unaccessible for me. But this was from somebody's library and I got it because I bought it really cheap. I typically like to read books the cheapest way possible. I'm a collector. I got expensive books. That's so weird. It doesn't make sense to you, I know. But I prefer to read a book where I don't gotta worry about what I do with it or what happens to it while I'm reading it. To me, that's an enjoyable reading experience. Zero cares given. But I read Antimatter Blues by Edward Ashton. This is a sequel to a book that I've already talked to you about called Mickey Seven by Edward Ashton. And just for an example, this is a signed limited edition from Fantasia Press. It comes in this nice, pretty, fancy slip case on the shelf. It's signed by the author. It's limited and numbered and all kinds has interior illustration there. All kinds of cool stuff about this book. I was saying it was signed, but I think it's signed in the back. I forget these things. It is signed indeed by the author. It is a limited edition and it's signed by Barclay Shaw, also the artist for the book. But I was really glad and excited to be able to get that copy from Fantasia. And I said then, I must read the sequel, Antimatter Blues, and which I have read so just a little bit. It's hard to talk about a sequel to a book without spoiling the first book, but I'll kind of boil down the first book, just the hair, and then I'll get into the sequel. In Mickey 7, there is a guy named Mickey Barnes, and he is an expendable on this ship going to an, an ex exploring to find a new planet that they've targeted for colonization called Nephilim. So they their way they do it is it's cheaper to have an expendable person than it is to have droids and sacrifice them because they're expensive to replace. So what they do, they clone people. Mickey Seven didn't have any skills. He had nothing that they wanted to go on this flight to this other planet. He had to get away from where he was at. He was in debt. The debt collectors were after him. Life was not good. He had to get away. So the only opportunity he had was to sign up for a program where they told him he would be immortal. Well, the way he's immortal is they download all of his thoughts and memories and personality and all that stuff, his DNA, physical characteristics, all into this system, this machine computer. He goes out and does all the dangerous things that's going to get somebody killed and he gets killed and they just <clears throat> squirt out a new version, a new Mickey Barnes. So it's got all of his memories and thoughts and personality and his DNA and all that stuff in there. But is it really him? Well, he finds out in Mickey seven, he finds out because through a snafu, he's left for dead. They create Mickey eight. But he didn't die. He comes back, finds out Mickey 8's there. He and Mickey 8 decide they're only going to let one of us live because, golly, it's already been proven you can't have multiples of the same person. It doesn't work out right. History has shown that's bad. They decide we don't want to die. So they're going to they come up with this plan to where they make everybody think that they're both Mickey 8. Well, that's Mickey 7. That's the book right there. That's kind of the main plot involved there. There are creatures on this Nephilim planet called Creepers, and Creepers are a big part of Antimatter Blues. So I want to talk now about some stuff that's going to spoil Mickey 7. If that's really going to bother you, plug your ears, cover your eyes, 
cover your mouth, whatever. Hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil, whatever. But it's going to spoil some stuff from Mickey 7. And so I'm going to jump on in. But I, I liked Mickey 7 a lot. I told you, for me, my taste, it was a five-star book. And uh, Antimatter Blues, I liked it a lot as well. It did have a, it did have a problem for me, which lowers the rating some. But I liked it so much that if they make a sequel to that, I'm reading it just as quickly as I can. I really like the series. I like the world. I like the, 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 the things on the planet. I like the, the characters. We've got some pretty good characters here that go from one first book to the next book. And that's, we're going to have some spoilers for Mickey 7. So are you ready? All right. At the end, this is spoilers now. At the end of Mickey 7, Mickey 8 is gone. He's been disassembled by the Creepers. They've, uh, they've taken the bomb that he had. They, they, they essentially, Mickey and Mickey 8, Mickey 7 and Mickey 8, took some bombs down there to blow up the tunnels where the Creepers live. Mickey 8 gets intercepted and disassembled. Mickey 7 has a change of heart. He is able to communicate with these creepers and he realizes that they mean him no harm and they're going to let him go. They, they don't look at people as all equal. They don't look at creatures as all equal. There is prime and then there is ancillary. Prime are the ones, and we won't get into it, explains it very well in Antimatter Blues. Prime are not expendable. Ancillary is, well, you can lose some of them. It's just like losing money or losing a vehicle. It's not somebody dying. It's just a loss of resources. But he convinces them that he's prime, that he means them no harm, and that they won't mess with the creepers if they don't mess with them. Away it goes. And Mickey Seven then goes back to Marshall, who is the boss of this colony on Nephilim. He doesn't like Mickey Seven at all, doesn't like any of the Mickeys at all. But he convinces them that he cut a deal with the Creepers. They kept one of the bombs, and if there is anything that happens, they'll blow up that bomb and kill the colony. And he's told them, I communicate with them, they communicate with me. So the only chance we have at peace is if I'm alive and I'm able to communicate with them. It turns out pretty good. Now he's no longer expendable. He is critical. Uh, now, he gave them back one of the bombs. These bombs are full of antimatter, which they use, the colony uses, for all of their energy resources. Everything that they do for heating, for whatever they do, it all comes from antimatter. All their energy comes from it. So they take one of the bombs that's full of this antimatter, they put it back into their machine that makes energy. He tells Marshall, the boss, that the creepers have the other bomb. It's a big bomb. It'll destroy everything. But it's not true. Creepers don't know what it is. He takes it. He puts it under a rock, a pretty good stretch away from their, their dome, their colony. So nobody will ever find it. He puts it under a rock, hides it. So, hey, we're good to go. And for two years now, this book is two years later. Two years have jumped. Mickey really he has no skills, doesn't contribute much. He's pretty much a slacker. He'll help out here and there. Living life. Living life. He and Nasha are still an item. He and Berto, who had a very rocky relationship in Mickey 7 for good reason, they are pals. They've kind of smoothed it over, although there's a little bit of when you leave your friend for dead. Kind of, <laughs> there's ruffled feathers just a little bit, but Berto moves on, and then and, and Annie Matter Blues. He's a little bit more likable character. He's a better character, a better friend, all that kind of stuff. But what has happened in Antimatter Blues, and I won't go too far, I won't spoil anything, but what has happened is they've messed up. They've lost a lot of antimatter. The scientists, the people that handle this junk, they've lost, wasted lots of the antimatter that they use for all of their energy sources. And so there's practically none left. Not enough to survive very long. They're all going to die. So Marshall goes to Mickey and says, you got to cut a deal with these creepers. They've got that other bomb. 
it's full of antimatter. That's antimatter that, that will let us live for 10 years or more here on this planet until we can get other things going. You got to get it back so we can put it into our thing and save the colony. Well, Mickey knows Marshall doesn't like him at all. He believes that if he gives him that bomb, he has zero leverage now to stay alive. They're just going to kill him. He's going to be expendable again. His life is done. But also he knows without that bomb, the uh, the village dies. Their colony dies. People that he cares about die. So he's in a pretty big dilemma. It's either we all live for a, not very much longer and we all die, or I do something that's probably going to be the end of me. So he decides, all right, it's a lot easier than Marshall thinks. Marshall thinks he's got to go negotiate with these creepers to get the bomb back, convince them to give it up. He don't. He's just got to go under, dig it up from under the rock and bring it in. Sounds like it should be pretty easy. They go out there to get the bomb, but guess what? It's gone. He finds the hole. There's no bomb. We are, we're in trouble. We got a problem here. Because what has happened in, uh, in the two years that have passed is summer came. This was an icy, snowy, uninhabitable colony here. They're living in a dome. They have to go outside in these suits, respirators, respirators, crap like that. Well, they still need respirators here, but summer has come. They didn't know they They realized that when they projected, we have to go out to this Nephilim colony. It was summertime. When they got there, it was wintertime, frozen over. Well, now summer has come back again, and it's a much better place, a much nicer, sunny, happy. Summer won't last forever, though, until we get back there again. So that's why they need the energy for heat, for food. They can't, they never figured out how to grow stuff in that icy environment. <clears throat> but now the bomb's gone. The future's gone. The hope is gone. Well, Mickey in Mickey 7 has this way. And the, they have these uh, reticle things in their eyes where they can communicate back and forth. It's kind of like text messages in their eyeballs. They blink. They blink and communicate. It's tied in somehow. It doesn't explain it. At least I don't remember how it explained it. But he's able to communicate with these creepers in this way. So he starts communicating with a creeper. Turns out that the creepers have been monitoring all of their communications and they've learned the language. They've learned to speak. And they have this one of them. These creepers are like uh, caterpillars with mandibles and all that kind of stuff. That they have what's called a speaker. This speaker now talks. Talks like Berto. So I think it was Berto. Yeah, I think he talks like Berto. But he talks, so now they're able to talk back and forth, conversation and all that stuff. The creeper said, hey, your bomb was found. They didn't know it was a bomb. Now they do. It was found. But our friends to the south have it. And our friends, they're not friends. They're enemies. They're much more powerful than the creepers. The creepers are afraid. And their friends to the south are enemies. They're afraid of them. But they have your, your bomb. So go get it from them. Now, they he makes it out like they're bad dudes. How are we going to get it from them? So Mickey strikes a deal with the Creepers saying, you help us go down to the south, this undisclosed location, can help convince them to give us our bomb back. Well, the Creepers say, look, if it comes to a fight... It's much easier for us to fight you, the colony, the humans, than it is to fight our friends of the South who are much more powerful than us. But we'll help. We'll help negotiate. So Speaker goes with him as a go-between, a negotiator. And this is where the book is no longer a five for me like Mickey Seven. I like everything about this story. I like all of the information that you get. I like the character development. I like the problem and I like the solution. I like the way this book ends. To me, the end is awesome. Now I saw Ty's Book Corners, another YouTuber, great lady, seems like a great lady. I love her channel anyway. I saw her review and she didn't like the end. She said it was confusing and they didn't spell things out and stuff like that. For me, the end was awesome. There's a moment, I won't tell you anything about it. There's a moment 
where I said, ah, yeah, and the goosebumps came up. It was kind of like for me, if you watch professional wrestling and Hulk Hogan is beaten down and it's all going to end. And in 84 and 85, you still were worried that it was all going to end. And right before it finishes, Hulk Hogan would hulk up. He would, the eyes would bug out. He would start shaking. Nothing would hurt him. But there was a moment that I felt kind of like that at the end of this book. And I loved it. I loved the end. The problem I had was from this setup that I gave you, where they're going to meet their friends at the South, in the South, to the point where the book finally comes to, this is how we're going to finish this story, and then into the finish. It was a long, long stretch to travel from the dome to where their friends from the South are. It was a long stretch. And they're traveling there in their rover, and they're running into problems along the way, and in the same problems and the same problems and the same problems over and over and over along the way. And it was tough. And there was a point here, which happens for me sometimes in books, where I just want to say, all right, move on now. It's time to move on. Let's get there. Or let's move on to the next thing. And, and that's okay. It's, it happens in books for me sometimes. But when it happens and I start thinking about, what if I skip a few pages? I didn't do that. But when I start considering skipping a few pages, it feels like it's, it's gone too far for me. It felt like a much shorter story than it actually ended up being. But a great story. I don't want to discourage you from reading it. I just want to let you know why, why I say this is a four-star book for me. Four-star book for me is a book that I really enjoyed, that I really liked, that I probably want more of. And I definitely want a lot more of this. I hope Edward Ashton just keeps on writing about Mickey Barnes. I hope he does because I'm in. I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed them both. <sighs> I don't want to get in too much deeper without spoiling things, but you learn about the, the creepers, uh, social stuff, how they socialize a little bit more about what they actually are, what they're made of. You also learn about their friends to the South, what they are and how they are different in, in ways and how different they are. But it, it's a, it's a really good book. I strongly recommend it. And I've already told you how I rate it four out of five. Uh, I, I really can't think of any more lies to tell. So thank you for your time. Thank you for joining me. I recommend you check out Mickey seven, check out Fantasia press, check out Edward Ashton, and then check out antimatter blues. Also, perhaps you may consider subscribing to the channel. I would appreciate it. It's kind of cool to see that number get higher little bit by little bit, little bit by little bit. Anyway, say la vie, baby. Do do. You just have to go to the wood room where all the